But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. September 11th, 2001, before nine in the morning, life as we knew it would be drastically changed. Four planes were hijacked, two of which crashed into the World Trade Center and brought it crumbling down. Before the dust could even settle, nearly 3,000 people were dead and even more were injured. I see, I remember that morning, perhaps not as well as some, but I remember. I remember staying home from school. I remember my mom having the TV on in the living room all day, switching through the various news channels. It's the same clip over and over and over again. The little corner with the bottom telling what TV station is is the only thing changing. TV volume is low. I remember mom just behind me in the kitchen, standing next to the corded phone that was on the wall back before the cell phones were the real popular thing, standing there waiting, wondering if a call would come, wondering if dad would have to go shift over a couple precincts to help cover things, or if dad would, the call for dad would come. I remember sitting there in silence playing with my sisters as trying to keep quiet so mom could hear the TV because she wouldn't turn it up loud enough so that it would bother everyone, but just on so it was in the background so she could keep up with things. I remember before the Twin Towers came crumbling down at lunch, I remember just sitting there looking at the two buildings and seeing it and not quite realizing all that it was. Yes, two buildings, yes, there's life, yeah, but I'm looking at these buildings and I can't quite figure out why it matters so much. But as an adult looking back, it makes a lot more sense when I know what was in those towers. The business leaders, the different people in commerce and finance and all of the different people that were heads of companies and the Fortune 500 companies that were in this building and the restaurants at the top, it was a big deal. There was a huge loss when all of those people in their respective fields were just gone in one moment. And I imagine the loss that we feel of the World Trade Center on some level matches the loss that the disciples would have felt with Paul when he was stoned. And as they approach him, I imagine some of those same emotions were going through their mind, the confusion, the chaos, the what, is, what are we going to do next? Because you see, Paul, he was that guy for them. Paul started out his life as Saul, persecuting Christians, and then through a miraculous transition became Paul, the believer, one of the disciples, the one who founded, helped found the church and go out and make disciples of all nations, the one that we look up to, the one who wrote majority of the New Testament. You see, he was that guy. He was the icon for the church, just like the Twin Towers were the icon for business and finance and trade for the country. And in much the same way that the skyline of New York City is forever changed, and the respective worlds of finance, business, and commerce are forever changed post-9-11, the church was radically changed after Paul's stoning here in Acts. And at this point, Paul is lying seemingly dead on the ground and everything seems lost and everything seems hopeless. But you see, Luke, the author of Acts, he was a physician before he was an author. And physicians, they think differently than some of us other people out there. I know they think differently than I do. They tend to be more literal, more calculated, more critical, more concise. For example, if I were to go in to a hospital or into a place of care and I have chest pains, dizziness, my arm might hurt, the physician has mere seconds to evaluate me, look at me and say, okay, anxiety attack, heart attack, I don't know, maybe there's a third option. But they have those critical moments in that first glance of trying to discern what it is that is going on, what is actually happening and they use their critical thinking skills to process through that. And that is what makes Luke's writings so unique. You see, he has the background of a physician, but he's writing with the intent to be a historian so that he can document all of these things. So he writes with such detail and attention. 
And it's because of all of these things that I love Luke as the writer of his gospel account, as well as for the book of Acts. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Doctor, as the writer of a book, that might seem a little crazy because this is before typewriters and before computers existed. So I don't know if you've known, but doctors have a typical style of handwriting. And I'm not one to talk here because I definitely have just this last week had to read back to one of my coworkers something that I had wrote. So I don't have a whole lot of room to talk. But you might say, Cody, have you ever tried to read a doctor's note after they've written? And I said, well, I've not really been able to read it. So but every time I've brought in that to a pharmacy and gotten a prescription, the prescription has been correct because the correct people were able to read it and understand what the doctor was intending. And I don't know if doctors in Luke's day and the day of the, the Bible times, if they had the same handwriting characteristics that doctors do today. But what I do know is that instances in verse 19 of Acts where Luke tactfully chooses his words so carefully because he doesn't want the re reader to be dismayed or, or to be derailed from the current thought. He wants the reader to be able to continue on concisely but also accurately understand what is happening. You see, he wrote, supposing that he was dead. Hope was not lost. Verse 20 continues on, but when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city and on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. And as somebody who looks back on history, I can say that when dawn broke on September 12th, the initial shock had begun to settle in for the American people. And America began to stand back up. Together as one nation, we stood back up. Together as one nation, we began the day united. And in much the same way, Paul got back up after being stoned and allegedly killed. On this side of heaven, tragedy is inevitable. However, as believers, we have hope that this is not the end. For the rest of our time today, we're going to be continuing on with Paul's journey in Acts chapter 14, starting with verse 21. If you have your Bibles or the smartphones with the ability to click through, we will be in Acts 14, 21. Luke writes, when they preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that though many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So, Obviously, Paul and Barnabas, they had to leave Lystra because the people of Lystra, despite a couple of verses back, having confused them for Greek gods, Zeus, like, oh, Paul, you guys are so great. You're like these little Greek gods. We must worship you. And Paul tells them, no, don't worship me. Here's the one God, the true God. Let me tell you about him. And they're like, no, we're going to worship you. And he says, I'm telling you, I'm not these Greek gods. They didn't believe him, but then when Paul and Barnabas didn't bring the gifts that they were expecting, the tangible blessings that they were expecting from their little G Greek gods, they got angry. And so when the Jews from the surrounding cities came in and said, hey, these people aren't who, they, who you think they are, we should stone them. They listened, and then they stoned them. So Lystra, it's no longer safe for them to just kind of hang out there and continue. So they move on. And after Paul's near-death experience, he had a choice to go to a secluded place, keep my faith to myself, kind of still maybe worship God a little bit, but nothing too crazy, or to continue boldly declaring all that Christ had done in his life. You see, it's that ladder that Paul held on to. He put aside his own personal woes of, I wonder what would happen if I get stoned again. Would I be able to survive again? This is kind of a scary thing. I don't know what the future might hold. And he puts it all aside and says, this is the important thing here. This is what is important. And he puts aside his personal problems, his personal worries, so that he can continue to strengthen, encourage, and establish leadership in the church. One of the ways that the church, he strengthened the church, is through the Greek word, eulangelitso. 
Euangelizo carries this connotation that somebody is proclaiming a specific message or divine message of salvation, or in English, we use it to be preaching the good news that all of God has to do. Euangelizo is not just the state of the union of, fa- of facts where somebody comes up and says, this is what we're doing, here it is. Euangelizo is the passionate bringing of the word of God. It has something more than just saying, here's what's up for today. It has this connotation with it that there's something exciting behind it, that there is something more than just the word that I am saying. Euangelizo is the joyful and exciting proclaiming of something great And I envision that when Paul is preaching the gospel, the people rallied behind him. That the people became excited. That they started to become energized and they started to be, okay, here we go. This is an important message. There is hope beyond this lifetime. There is something more here to life than just what we have to live. And now I envision that in some ways. That excitement that those people were feeling when Paul was preaching I envision that excitement looked a lot like the excitement did days after 9-11 when President Bush stands on the smoldering fire truck at ground zero with the World Trade Center in the background still smoldering. People are still milling about trying to find more survivors. There's heavy machinery going and President Bush stands up and he looks at the people and he grabs a bullhorn and he starts speaking to them. But because there's so much chaos going around, one of the gentlemen in the back screams out, I can't hear you. And in one of the most profound speeches in my generation, the president grabs the bullhorn, leans in, and says, I hear you. We hear you. The world hears you. And at that moment, everybody in the audience, everyone standing at ground zero erupts and they start chanting, USA, USA. Because they had been given a message of hope. They had been given that feeling of we hear you, we understand you. I'm with you. And you see, Just like how when the president gave the news that the people are heard and the people erupted. I imagine that's what Paul's preaching often felt like as he was going about throughout these churches. He brought the Yulangel Litzo. He brought the good news of God. And it is so much greater than just that you are being heard in a time of struggle. Not to minimize what was going on at that point. But to bring the parallel that there's something bigger and greater than just being heard. The Yulangelitso, the preaching of the good news. What really gets me excited about listening back to this address and getting to hear it now, 20 years later, is getting to hear and see the power that just telling somebody they're heard has. It just gives me goosebumps to think that that has a lot of weight and that has a lot of power. And then I think about the gospel message. The good news that Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross for my sins. I think about that good news, and I think about how much more impactful that is than just being heard. And I think that we have the euangelizo. We have the good news to keep going out and to preaching to these people to tell everyone about. Because we have better news than just that you're heard. We have the news that Jesus Christ came for our sins. He came for me, and he came for you. See, Paul knew that. He knew that preaching the gospel, that the telling others about the good news of Christ, that would be one of the most profound things that he could do with his life. So he got back up. By all accounts, he should have just stayed down. I mean, being at the point of near death, I'm sure his body was in pain. He was broken. It wouldn't have been easy to get back up, but by the strength of God, he did. He got back up, and he continued on preaching the good news. He used his preaching, the Euangelizo, to not only share the good news, but to also encourage the disciples to continue in faith. You see, Paul knew that God could be the only one that could sustain true and genuine faith in someone's life. He knew that there was very little he could do. But he also knew that God would use him and his prayers for the people and his preaching to keep them encouraged and to keep them going. And so he continued on with 
going forward, like, I, I have to do this because this is what God is using me for. And so he continued on. Who would have thought that 2,000 plus years later that we would have been in the same boat, that we would have continued on with this tradition of prayer and teaching, of Eulangelitzo, of the proclaiming of the good news. We just refer to this time now as simply as church. But we continue to do that same practice that Paul started in the church centuries ago. You see, in the early days of the church, Paul saw a problem. When he would leave, he and Barnabas or whoever he was with on their journey, when they would leave, there would be a power vacuum and then the people needed someone to tell them what to do and how to keep going and how to keep encouraged. And so as he saw this problem, he started appointing elders in the church so that when he was absent from the church, that they could be continuing on with the message, with the euangelizo, with the preaching of the good word, that they can continue on praying for fellow believers because that was what was important. And to this day, we still use elders in the church to help guide and shepherd the spiritual practices of the church. Now, if you haven't seen it already, in these next few verses, Luke really embraces his inner doctor, and he takes this precision and clarity to what I would consider a whole nother level. Verse 24 continues with, Then they passed through Poseida and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia, and from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. Now, if you're like me, I am what I would call really directionally challenged. And so as I'm reading this for the first time, I start hearing cities and directions, and I start to get overwhelmed, and it just goes right over my head. Well, I'll just GPS it later. But after consulting several commentaries and rereading the passage several times, it starts to stand out in a different light. And I start to see what Luke is doing here. He's not just giving a list of where they had been. That would be too easy. The list is important. It's a key piece to the puzzle, you see, because in the list, we find not only congregations and cities that they had been on their journey, but that list includes cities that they had not been to yet. So Paul and Barnabas are going on this journey, and they're going about spreading the good news of God and all that he has done in their life, and they're going on this missionary journey. And on their way back, instead of just hitting up all of the same spots, they stop at a couple different places to bring the good news for the first time. See, after Paul's stoning, he didn't just keep running the same play. He didn't just keep it easy and hide out. No, he kept going and he kept preaching. But he didn't just keep preaching in the towns that he knew would accept him. He didn't go back to the people that he knew would want to hear him again. While he did do that, he also went out into other towns and cities to keep bringing the good news. Because for him, the ends of the world had not been met. The gospel message still had to keep going out to each and every person generation to each and every nation see clearly paul was not done with his mission and luke so perfectly records that in a section that i might have overlooked had i not taken a little bit more time to process that it's not just the same cities but that he adds in the cities after completing their first missionary journey paul and barnabas returned to antioch and upon their arrival luke records that and when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had appoint, opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. See, I can just imagine the excitement that Paul and Barnabas would have had as they returned, going door to door, saying, guys, guys, we're back, we're back, here we are. This is where we started. You guys sent us out. Let me tell you about all the things that we've done so far. We've gone so far. There's been so many trials. There's been some ups and there's been some downs. Come, church, gather. Let me tell you all that we have done. 
I just, I wish I could have seen it. I wish I could have seen the light on his face, the light in his eyes, the excitement as Paul's trying to go. And he says, church, here we are. Look at what we've done. Look at how far the word of God has gotten. You see, it wouldn't have been easy for Paul to get back up after being stoned. The enemy broke his body with stones. But yet by the power of God, he stood up and he continued on. And because of his testimony, the door of faith was opened for the Gentiles in a way that they had not seen before. The tragedies of 9-11 brought the United States into a place that it had not seen before. But on September 12th, 20 years ago, the country rallied around a common enemy, and together the country mourned. Together the country fought. And together the country began rebuilding. Together the people of all political parties stood with one common goal. The testimonies of us in here today and those of us who are watching online are sitting ready. We're sitting ready to tell others to be able to open that door of faith for someone else in our lives for who might not believe just yet, or who might be on the fence trying to question this spirituality, this God thing. Our testimonies sit there, ready, waiting. Yet, for many of us, our own words our Facebook posts, whatever it may be, snide comments, the horn in traffic when the person cuts you off, is preventing us from opening that door of faith, from sharing the good news. You see, September 12th, 20 years ago, everyone was united. Everyone stood together. Yet 20 years later, Family members are struggling to sit at the same kitchen table because they went to Walmart and didn't do the right thing, didn't wear the right thing, didn't look the right way, didn't do whatever it may be, only 20 years later. And how quickly we've turned into the people of Lystra. We have these little Greek gods, these little idols in our lives, whether it be normalcy or the desire to be correct or the desire to be my way is right. This is true. How could you not understand my truth? Can't you use Google? Can't you understand what the newspaper is saying? These are our little gods that we keep putting up and we keep saying this is what it is. But what they're doing is they're getting in our way of being able to share the good news with those around us. We keep putting up these little barriers that won't let us get through to the people who are right there next to us. We keep holding our story locked away instead of letting the door of faith be opened for those to hear. But all too often, Sunday morning rolls around. And whether actually physically in the next row, whether it be in the next row in another town, whether it be online, wherever it may be, that person might come. They might be here at church. And the figure of Jews of Antioch come and they tell us, look at your little Greek gods. They're not doing the right thing. We must hold them at bay. We can't have them here. Don't talk to them. Don't share what God has done in your life because they're the little Greek gods. They're not going to do anything for you. And so we listen to it. We listen to that voice like, I won't talk to them because you should have seen what they posted on Facebook. You would be appalled. There's no way they can sit at church today. Church, we stand here today with one calling, one purpose, and one God, but yet we are more divided than ever. There's every little thing that just seems to be getting in the way of unity in the church today. Not just the church of Circleville, but the capital C church, the church of the world. But what would happen if, instead of being so quick to dismiss and to push off, we listened? 
We listen to that person who's different from us. We listen to that family member who just keeps going on about the different things about how they're correct. What would happen if we didn't just listen, but we listened and we heard what they were saying? That we cared for people regardless of what they were thinking or what they were posting on Facebook. I have those friends. We went to the same church growing up, and I look at their Facebooks, and I'm like, what are you thinking? How could you post that? We grew up together. That is so crazy. But what if we show that we cared by hearing them, by making them feel heard, like when the president f- made the people feel heard during their tragedy and their trials? Maybe the trials of the people who we are having the hardest time listening to aren't that great and as big as 9-11 but they're still big and great in their lives. What if we listened and we heard what they had to say? You see, after Bush's address to the people at Ground Zero, there was not a single American flag in any store to be found. They were all flying in front yards and windows, in the back of trucks, in the back of cars, They were everywhere, but on the shelves of the store. Because the country rallied together behind the message. They rallied together as one unit. When those saw Paul get up and continue on proclaiming the word, the very thing he was stoned for, that he boldly took the gospel into the places that it had not been, and because that door had previously not been opened, and it was open now, Paul and Barnabas came back with a report unlike any other. And when they came back to Antioch, the church was rallied together and excited because of the good things that they had been doing. What would it take for that to be true for us? Church, we're at a pivotal point. The gospel message is needed in the world now more than it has ever been. And if we're too busy focusing on the things of this world we could very well miss the eternal and the godly things. If we put our focus on the things of this world, we could very well not have the strength to stand back and to continue telling others of all that Christ has done in us and through us. If we continue taking our little Greek gods and keep keeping people at a distance instead of embracing them for who they are and loving them like Christ loved us, if we don't break down that wall, How are we showing the gospel to them? Would we not then be living with the love of Christ in our hearts and it overflowing in abundance to those who need? This week it is my challenge that we find that person who might be different, difficult, put in the adjective that you're struggling with, and that we would listen to them. Listen not just to let the words come out, but listen to hear not to respond, not to refute, to debate, but to listen to hear so that we could go through the door of faith that God has started to open. Because God has opened a door of faith for each and every one of us in other people's lives just by simply the way we live. Whether or not we slam the door shut by putting our little idols in front of it or whether we continue to go through it is up to us. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our time here today. Lord, we pray for all of those who were lost, hurt, or in mourning of the events that happened on 9-11. Lord, we pray that as we go about leaving these walls today, that we could be the church of September 12th, that we could rally together and make a difference for you. God, that we could put aside any selfish ambitions that we have so that we could go out and share the love that you have given to us with others so that they too may experience your love. God, you are great, and it is by your, in your holy name that we pray. Amen.